the pace of rate increases is the fastest of any other tightening cycle. And that's dangerous because there's typically a 12 month lag in uh, policy, mo uh, monetary policy and the economy. By that uh, uh, reality, we haven't even seen the impacts of the rates going from, let's say, three to 375, let alone where they currently are uh, at four and three eighths. It's not a good situation because things tend to break. Um, everybody's, you know, you get the pundits on TV that are already applauding the Fed for threading this needle. It's not even close that they've threaded the needle yet. Now, it is possible that they do it but I actually think it's highly unlikely um, because of this lag monetary policy. Today, we're discussing the rapid pace of interest rate increases and the potential impacts these have on the economy, as highlighted by Greg Foss. With rates jumping from 3 to over 4% in a short period, the question arises, what does this mean for investors, the general public, and the future of monetary policy. Before we dive into this complex topic, we encourage you to subscribe and like our video. Your support helps us bring more insightful content your way. Now let's unpack the current situation. The Federal Reserve's aggressive monetary tightening cycle is unlike any other, with a typical lag of 12 months before the real impacts are felt. Despite some pundits applauding the Fed's efforts, Greg Foss suggests caution, deeming their success in threading the needle as highly unlikely. Let's explore why this is and what it could mean for the future of our financial system. Successive financial crises always happen faster and the, the unwind is more painful, the deleveraging. So, you know, way too early to declare victory by the Fed. Remember that inflation compounds, like everyone's celebrating that it's come down to six and a half percent. But guys, you know, going from eight percent to six and a half percent means it's a 14% annualized inflation rate over, you know, over the last uh, uh, start to finish. That's not that good. Okay. And then you could go 8%, 6.5%, 4%, 3%, 1%, 4%, and you're still at something like a 5% annualized inflation rate. Why? Because the first 8% is compounded all the way through the next periods. Okay. So this is part of the mathematics that people don't understand as well. So. It's just so simple in my mind that if you actually took and paid attention to your grade 11 mathematics courses, you would see through this charade that the Fed is trying to uh, accomplish. But it's no different than all the other cycles. That's the problem with monetary policy that is set to a degree and manipulated. And that's why we need to fix it. And that's where Bitcoin comes in. Um, you know, the arguments for that. But again, I just go back to looking at a debt spiral that the average coupon on the debt at the end of the year was one and a half percent. But 35 percent of that debt is going to roll over in the next uh, two years. So of the 31 trillion dollars of debt, more than 10 trillion of that debt needs to be refinanced. And if you assume that it's going to refinance at a rate that mimics the U.S. 10-year rate, you're going from a 1.5% coupon on that debt to 3.5%, okay? And it already was a debt spiral before with historically low interest rates. Now that you accelerate the interest rates, it becomes even more severe. So the Fed can suck and blow all they want and say that they've done a good job in containing inflation, which is not true. But the reality is I don't care. Because the bigger picture is fiat debasement, the certainty of fiat debasement, and therefore the need to hedge that reality. Fiat debasement is assured. It's a certainty. And you need to hedge that certainty. If you do it with other hard assets besides Bitcoin, that's better than owning soft assets like bonds, uh, where, yeah, I'm a hero. I invested in uh, U.S. 10-year treasuries at a 3.5% yield. I held it for 10 years, but the $100 I initially invested at time zero is now got $65 of purchasing power. So, I mean, like you just, you got to understand it, but you got to look at it both ways. Um, so yeah, own hard assets and companies need to manage their exposure similar to individuals. And then countries need to manage their exposure similar to companies, similar to individuals, which is to say, you know, you see on the comp 
the company side, you'll see a micro strategy. Then you saw Tesla, but not really the adoption that we thought would happen yet. But it's still so early. And maybe people learn when they see a BlackRock had made an allocation to their fund. Okay, good. Like you see these things and slowly then suddenly, right? Foss points out that each financial crisis unfolds faster than the last with more severe consequences. Despite inflation rates dropping from 8% to 6.5%, the reality is far from celebratory. This reduction still translates to a significant annualized inflation rate, exposing the flaws in the Federal Reserve's strategy. Furthermore, the looming debt spiral poses a grave threat, with a significant portion of the U.S.'s $31 trillion debt due for refinancing at higher interest rates. The fiscal sustainability of such a model is questionable. Here, Bitcoin emerges as a beacon of hope. Its fixed supply and detachment from traditional fiat systems presented as a hedge against the inevitability of fiat debasement. I'm in Boston right now. Um, even though I'm a Canadian, I'm down in Boston because we're having a Boston meetup uh, celebrating a, uh, a great group of Bitcoiners in this town, but also Jason Lowry, who's a U.S. Space Force, soon to be a native of Florida or a citizen of, or not a citizen, I guess, or just a, I guess, in a li living there, neighbor in, in Florida of yours. Um, he, uh, he's going to go work at Cape Canaveral. He is trying to orange pill the Department of Defense and argues that Bitcoin would be exactly what you're saying, where countries need to hold it as a store of value to stabilize their fiat currencies and also defend themselves against other countries that are going to win this race. So Jason last night was giving, uh, this is Jason Lowry, um, is giving some really cool uh, stories about, you know, some of his the uh, war, uh, when I say war, like soft war thesis where, you know, he thinks that Russia and China have already stockpiled a meaningful amount of Bitcoin and they're allowing the U.S. to fumble the ball in order to uh, assure that the U.S. won't uh, be a challenge to their uh, holdings of Bitcoin and slight gold. Both of those countries are, are stockpiling a bunch of gold and all for the same reasons, because they don't want to hold U.S. treasuries as a store of value, because that is a bad risk management decision, much like uh, it is, in my opinion, for small investors to hold too many bonds or fixed income instruments where your principal value is debased because of the debasing currency. So whether it's going to be a country like El Salvador leading to a bigger South American country, like potentially Brazil leading to a bigger brick like Russia uh, and more important brick, I guess I should say, because of the petroleum exports. But imagine if Putin turns around and someday says, yeah, you know what? I'm going to start pricing oil in Bitcoin. And that's brilliant from my perspective as an engineer. I can see, uh, you know, why would you sell your valuable natural resource energy for, you know, debasing fiat dollars when you could sell it for the equivalent of digital energy or uh, or, or Bitcoin? Uh, these things happen. They happen slowly than suddenly. But Bitcoin still is only 14 years old. So coming back to my risk hat, I've been doing this for over 30 years and Bitcoin has only existed for just over you know, more than 50% of my career, but really like one third of my risk management career, because I didn't take Bitcoin seriously in 2009, 2010. I did some research on it. Luckily, I never closed the door on it um, entirely. But the reality is Bitcoin is just now getting to be a big enough asset class as in itself for more big money to get interested in it. You can't own all the Bitcoin at $2 US per Bitcoin and then you own it all and then it doesn't do anything because you own it all. Like you have to wait for it to get dispersed around the globe, allow it to create the network effects that are making it so exciting. So it's a uh, it's always going to be game theory. Try not to overthink the game theory, though. The reality is back to first principles, fiat debasement is 100% certain. It doesn't mean that Bitcoin succeeds, but as of now, I believe it to be the best horse in the race and the fastest horse in the race, as Paul Tudor Jones says. But again, do I own a little bit of gold? Of course I do. I own other commodities, silver, oil, et cetera. Um, I'm not short bonds anymore, but I certainly do not have an allocation to bonds uh, anywhere near what some of these 60-40 portfolios advocate. That's just dated mathematics and dated uh, risk management policies. 
So it's not easy. Like we're trying to break down so many different walls, but you chip away and it you make your progress. The notion that countries, not just individuals or corporations, might begin to hold Bitcoin as a store of value to counteract fiat currency instability is groundbreaking. The global race for Bitcoin accumulation, particularly by nations like Russia and China, underscores the urgency for the U.S. and others to reconsider their financial strategies. Could the future see commodities like oil priced in Bitcoin? Such a move could redefine global trade and elevate Bitcoin's role in the world economy. As we look at Bitcoin's journey, it's clear that its impact and relevance are only beginning to unfold. The challenges of fiat debasement, inflation, and financial crises call for innovative solutions, and Bitcoin stands out as a promising contender. Whether you're a seasoned investor or new to the crypto space, the importance of understanding these dynamics cannot be overstated. Thank you for joining us on Unscripted Crypto. Remember, the world of finance is complex and ever-changing. Staying informed and adaptable is key. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this video for more insights.